Rock and roll. Kia ora everybody, what's up? It is Robet. Welcome to Robet Live. Another day, more action, more weapons in the mix. I'd say we have, uh, first off the ranks, Managing Director at Quantiful, Alan Gordy. How are you, bro? Good, thanks, sir, Robert. We're Very well, say- thank you. We're saying you've uh, you got look like you've got some nice isolation set up behind you. You've got some space. There's not crazy cats and dogs and fifty flatmates running around. You seem like you're in a pretty calm environment. Yeah, I got a bit of sun this morning too. Yeah, I've got a little bit of space, and so uh, keeping the uh, not keeping the uh, family away, but definitely uh, like to retreat to your own space. I get it. Um, for those who aren't aware of uh, Quantiful, uh, quick quick insight up up, up um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the business, so people don't know. So, uh, Quantiful is essentially a data science company that helps customers with their uh, planning. What we do is um, we go into uh, markets um, right around the world, such as uh, China, um, Southeast Asia, New Zealand, Australia, etc., and we pull large-scale consumer data from those markets um, uh, from different channels: um, uh, social search, um, blogs, forums, etc., um, and we analyze that for buying signals. Um, And that's important for our customers because they want to understand not what's happened in the past, but what's coming up. And so these buying signals are are good indicators of future trends in those markets. Um, And we then take that uh, that data, uh, millions and millions of uh, data points, and we then, uh, using uh, machine learning, we apply that to our customers' um, uh, sales and provide them with more accurate forecasts. So in a nutshell, Robert, that's what we do. It's... um the, you probably obviously know the correct power analytics with it, what they're doing from the, the content sort of side of things in, in that world U- using the whole data piece how it plays into retail it's the insights of data for human behavior based on social interactions and stuff is quite a fascinating space I'm sure there's lots of big brains that work there at the company uh, you're based obviously in Auckland you're, you're, you're safe and sound at the moment um, let's get straight into some gnarly data sh- shit retail is stuffed right now what do you think is going to happen after this to retail how do you think it how, what do you what are your yeah, what are your what are your predictions because i guess retail has never really gone to zero like this apart from maybe just the supermarkets right how what what happens after this in your opinion well i guess one of the uh, markets that um uh, we're quite interested at the moment is, is china and um and we track um, major cities, the performance of, uh, well, what consumer behavior is in, in major cities like Shanghai, um, for example. And they're quite interesting because they're uh, two to three weeks, maybe even a month ahead of us in terms of um, coming out of the, you know, the COVID virus situation. And so we're, we're watching consumer behavior in those markets quite, quite closely. And so initially, uh, one or two days after, um, up to a week after restrictions were lifted, which was around about two to three weeks ago, um, I think since the 1st of April, pretty much schools and businesses have been have been reopened. So people were initially cautious because uh, there was a sort of a stranger danger fear um, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, that, in that they were, they, they even though they could go out, they were reluctant to do so. Because and if you think about it, the, the government messaging, the the, you know your friends and, and, and so on telling you you know uh, that that there is an infection risk that, that's not immediately just going to wash wash away and you're going to get back to normal immediately but in the end you know what we're seeing is that the the need for variety the need for novelty the need for social contact again um, starts to very quickly override uh, those concerns and so you have to bear in mind that um, in in those markets or in that market anyway um, you have to wear a mask when you go out um, in public. That's compulsory. Um, there's temperature checks pretty much everywhere, uh, you know, before you enter public transport, before you enter the supermarkets, um, much like here, but probably even more so. Um, and so you're reminded constantly. Um, but what we're seeing is that after about the first week, the recovery is starting to gather real momentum. And so people are returning to retail. Um, there are still some restrictions on things like restaurants and so on. Where um, again, you there's no more shared tables. For example, mm. you can't sit down with a, another stranger at the table. Um, you have to go in your family group and so on. So, um, so I'm optimistic. You know, I think that um, you know, whilst it'll be everybody's choice in the end at the speed with which they, um, you know, get back to shopping, and um, of course, it assumes that everything's open. But I'm optimistic that there will be a 
um, a slightly faster recovery than perhaps um, you know uh, people think at the moment because of those fundamental needs that people have for you know just for social contact and and to get a bit of variety and novelty back into their lives. So I think um, you know you can talk about different retail outlets and so on, and you know clearly um, you know what we are seeing if, um, uh, in terms of different sectors. Uh, the, the economy um, and economic pressure is overriding now health concerns, and and that is driving a lot of people's behaviour. So, uh, for example, um, uh, high end uh, premium products and and retail servicing those sectors, um, and restaurants in the high end, for example, um, slower to recover. Um, uh, you know, two reasons. One. You know, people concerned about um, obviously uh, their finances and and looking to cut back. A lot more people putting money into saving. The property market, interestingly, is starting to um, get real interest in in um, uh, some of these major cities um, as people look to invest to uh, protect their um, savings and interests, um, uh, expecting tougher economic times. So high end um, retail um, are still slow and and struggling mid to you know low tier retail um coming back pretty quick for the reasons i mentioned earlier yeah as soon as the, that discretionary spending of you know dropping 5g on that louis bag doesn't sound so appealing after you've been locked in a house for a little bit you probably maybe want escapism to, to get elsewhere so just rewinding it because you touched on a couple points there which i want to get to the first was the joy of data that is globally accessible enables you to be able to see what's happening everywhere right and the kind of the 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 interesting bit around how data is spread and being used in different uh, cases for say like new zealand is you know you can literally see what happened exactly there how they how their behaviors changed when it started to get like um not locked down right now when we were talking to uh, jason paris the ceo of vodafone they were having a daily call with all the ceos from all the vodafones around the world and there's this weird uh, thing, and he was saying it was amazing because in this closed, obviously trusted circle, hey, when this thing happened, dot, 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 dot. When this thing happened, dot, dot, dot. And you could almost see from afar, hey, when this happens, we need to do this, that, that. So the data of what you're seeing now, weirdly enough, it's going to give you really great insight to exactly the, some countries are going to, um, you'll get like almost a, 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 a blueprint on what should or shouldn't be done based on the actual outcomes that people are seeing in real time around the world right like you're probably gonna you, you're at what you, you're at probably a three-week head start at the moment and as more countries come online is your headspace thinking let's watch who does what how and see those those bits and then try and use that back around how does your headspace sort of r- roll that out well we, we use um obviously we've been doing this before um uh COVID and so uh, we use the uh, buying signals that we see and look for um, patterns of behavior which influence um, sales demand. And then because we project that uh, pattern of behavior forward, we can then also give um, a, a pretty uh, strong indication of how sales down the SKU level will respond to that um, change in, the, in, in buying signal. So uh, when we when we look at and you know uh, I know Jason well we we do a lot of work in the telecommunications industry in New Zealand for both um, a good dude. Spark and Vodafone and um, yeah he's doing a fantastic job out there um, uh, you know uh, trying times for everybody but particularly you know the leaders of these big um, uh, 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 you know corporates with many staff and so on that need to be looked after. Uh, particularly when they're, you know, customer facing the way that um, uh, companies like Vodafone and Spark are and having to deal with the, you know, the public and their concerns. So, uh, so for example, some of their concerns, are, there's a, you know, we track the telco industry and, and mobile device use, for example. Um, one of the biggest concerns for um, their customers now is things as simple as, well, what happens if my phone gets lost, stolen and broken now? Um, mm. uh, you know, their their connection to their phone and uh, and keeping it safe and not um, getting it damaged is um, so much greater now because of their perception that it may not be able to be replaced or or repaired. I mean, it can be, but it's much more difficult to do so. Um, things like um, you know, in terms of their sales and their business, um, they obviously again, you know, pricing pressure uh, and concerns about pricing is 
getting is now seeing people look at uh, obviously lower tier devices. Um, they suddenly wonder, can their device be used for contactless payment? Something they never thought about before, because yeah. that's what they want. And so suddenly they're thinking about those sorts of um, uh, you know features on their phones. Um, and of course, things like um, you know these uh, headphones that we're wearing, noise cancelling headphones, and demand for those have gone, as you might expect, through the roof. Yeah. Um, so those are just uh, you know, and there's many other signals like that mm. that you know that affect what they now buy and stock in their stores going forward, um, and that's going to have to change and keep changing, you know, as we move into these different phases. Uh, post-COVID. So yes, we track that on a daily basis. We ingest that data, uh, millions of data points, as I said, daily, and then interpret that against um, you know, their existing portfolio of sales. And then from that, they can use our tool Q to identify what what changes. And those changes, by the way, have suddenly become a lot, a lot more important for them because supply chains are breaking down globally. And, and this is now, you know, perhaps less um, obvious to people um, is that you know before a company could expect to be resupplied within you know a matter of weeks um, because air freight freely available with passenger aircraft you know uh, uh, restrictions half New Zealand's freight goes in the belly as you know of um, passenger aircraft and so suddenly all of those flights aren't flying anymore so supply chain suddenly takes three months to get resupplied mm. so your planning's got to be that much better now. In order to to yeah. project that that far forward, because you don't have that immediate resupply, and you know the just in time principle starts to break down. So there's all of these sorts of challenges, and yes, that's the type of data that we collect. Um, we look at it anywhere in the world. Mm. The, even, I was just going to say, even just that alone, from a um, logistics standpoint, if you're then talking about a three month lag time that's going to just tie up cash for these businesses as well. Then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, we've got this risk to get all this shit, but is it worth potentially putting the, the business on the line for every day for these products we're going to maybe may or may not get in a couple of months. So it's going to change the psyche of, of buying from a wholesale perspective for sure. Right? Like, I mean, what's the, I was, going to, I was going to say, so each time a country goes at a different level, you're seeing they can get access to, you know, potential, there's going to be non, essential services and obviously safe services. It feels like that's the wording I'm sure they're using. Safe services. Have you already predicted down what different types of products or industries are going to have different demands at those different sections of three, two, and then on the way down? Like where's your headspace at thinking of what you've seen around the world with the data insights from the retail demand of what consumers will be doing um, for New Zealand? Well, we, uh, I mentioned that um, you know, some of the markets that we track um, uh, are starting to come out, but that's relatively few at that stage. It's, you know, most of the Western markets are still either in lockdown or um, talking about coming out of lockdown as opposed to being out of it. So there's relatively few. Southeast Asia and, um, and China, as I mentioned, um, are, you know, what, uh, 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 are relatively rare in that they're now starting to um, come out of the... Uh, so I've only got, at this stage, um, whilst we're tracking uh, demand and, and behaviour in those other markets, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the West um, seeing some of those behaviours um, and those markets opening up again. That's so, why we're using it as Southeast Asia and Asia for that purpose. And oh, I mentioned yeah. a, you know, a couple of the... They're, they're leading indicators in, in many instances. Um, and I mentioned a couple of the trends um, uh, earlier in terms of you know, the, the first week or two after the um, uh, uh, restrictions were lifted. Um, the, the, to, just to give you an idea, um, you know, some of the restrictions, and I mentioned mask, mask wearing, for example, that, that does affect um, some industries, particularly um, restaurants and, and the fitness industry. No one really wants to exercise and in, 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 in these markets, you have to wear your mask while you're exercising, for example. So that still puts a damper on the on the fitness industry. Um, for um, uh, restaurants, uh, I've mentioned the high end or premium outlets. Um, for even for uh, uh, socialising in general, a lot of people don't like the uh, the lack of sort of social intimacy that comes with having to wear a mask when you do go out and and uh, and dine. You're obviously not wearing it while you're eating. 
but it, it takes away something from the, the the enjoyment of that experience. Yeah, well, getting on so, the, you can't scull jugs with a flipping mask on, can you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, I was so, thinking about so, straws coming out the side and shit. <laughs> <laughs> But on the other hand, you know, some industries are absolutely booming, as you would be well aware from talking to, you know, the gaming industry. We track uh, mobile gaming in uh, Indonesia, um, uh, you know, for for a client. And that's absolutely booming um, for obvious reasons. And so different sectors, uh, you know, different um, uh, uh, responses um, uh, to or or challenges uh, from the COVID lockdown, some of them are doing very well as a result of it. And others, as you say, as we come out of the lockdown, are starting to um, uh, 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 re-gear and pivot their business to accommodate some of these um, changes in consumer behaviour that I've mentioned. Shit data is powerful when you keep drilling down into all those different things because there's so much you can learn across each different piece. I've been thinking about the human behaviour that's changing, changed, and, and potentially will change through this. And one of the ones I've been wondering, and I'll, I'll be really interested in your take on it, is um, people that have been at home, they haven't shopped and bought up a whole bunch of, you know, fast fashion bullshit and maybe a whole bunch less, you know, fast food and just eating out every single day and blah, blah, blah. Um, when you look at consumerism of how cus- the general pu- population has kind of rolled for the last little while, do you, and I think there's going to be this funky wave of new minimalism come across. It's like, maybe I don't need that thing. Maybe I don't need that. Do I actually, do I need that thing? The same way that, you know, the high-end fashion might be wondering, do they drop the 5G or not? Do you think there will be a rise in min- mainstream minimalism? Because they're now in a, if you've been on lockdown for, I think they were saying, is it the 21 days? And then that's when your body gets into that new routine of the, the new way. Do you, do you feel that that may happen for the mainstream? Well, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the the, the economic um, impact, um, and I think, Robert, are you are you more referring to people's mindset as opposed to their yeah. their, their their perception about the affordability of uh, of goods yeah, of, not of the goods, affordability? Or? Just like because um, I've talked to a couple of people who've literally said, "Yeah, I don't think like when I go out, I'm going to probably buy as much like shit." Just like. Fast, more probably fast fashion, right? The more just, you know, this whole bunch of hoodies and t-shirts and shoes and blah, just like buying stuff for stuff's sake. Actually, like, you know, I, I maybe need less, you know, of certain things and, and being a bit more selective around the type of things that they actually choose to, choose to purchase. Um, that, yeah, more, more from that side. Uh, well, I, I think there, you know, there, there will be a, um, a, you know, minimalism, conservatism, um, uh, you know, perhaps informed by um, uh, uncertainty about about the future, and and maybe as you say, a recognition of um, that you know they don't need as much. It's you know more uh, they've had this more simple lifestyle, and maybe that's as much as they need. But what I would point out is that, um, uh, that in the markets that we are tracking, which have come out, then the the, the recovery has been uh, quicker. Than uh, we might think, because you know, in the end, you know, uh, people are people, and that you know, they crave that social contact. Um, you know, they they crave that ability to to have um, uh, novelty, um, to you know, experience um, you know the enjoyment of of new experiences and fun. And of course, the products that they buy to um, accompany those are are often um, uh, you know, fashion and, uh, and and what have you. And so, uh, given yeah. all, yeah, all I can, uh, you know, we don't we don't track the fashion industry um, uh, currently, so um, I, you know, I don't have a particular lens on that from the the data that we use. So I'm speculating when I say that, um, you know, I, I I think that some of the um, experiences and and thoughts that people uh, and beliefs that people have formed, as you say, in the four four weeks, it's enough time to form a new habit. Uh, I'm sure some of those um, will stick. If I look at, as I mentioned, some of the markets that we do track, um, you know, people's uh, cooking at home and, um, uh, you know, uh, and the enjoyment of that um, uh, and p- potentially, therefore, not going out to a restaurant or buying in food as much 
um, maybe something that um, rather than you know two or three times a week, or if you're doing it once every every two or three weeks, you might um, uh, you know cut that back. But other things I think like expressions of ourselves as we start to socialise again are going to bounce back probably faster than we think. Um, uh, Danny says, uh, my partner runs a bakeware online shop and she's finding it hard to keep up with her orders. However, my electronics shop sales are down by 70%. Pe um, people think we are not delivering. Uh, and then Ben Slater says, restaurants live and die by the amount of seats they can fit into a space. Social distancing or dining will fundamentally change this. That's probably pretty accurate because, yeah, thoughts there? Well, I think so. That that's just, I think um, uh, you know your um, your your viewers there are, are are quite correct. In the end, there there are, as we know, restrictions on the number of people that can be in any premise. Um, you know, uh, restaurants are going to be no difference once um, uh, you know they do start allowing people back. You know, into the physical premise, and you know there there will be um, I'm I'm guessing regulations on the distance between tables and chairs, which will mean for many smaller places and there's thousands of those obviously uh, you know in in uh, in most of it everywhere um therefore they're just you know fewer people will be able to get into those places so i think yeah. um those are the sorts of things that we're uh, you know going to see more of but but that's you know um clearly um uh, uh some of your your you know viewers are in the trade and will be seeing these things and feeling these things um you know much more deeply than i and i feel for them because um you know, it's, it's it's tough. We're a small business too, and um, uh, it, it, uh, again, some of the markets that we track, you know, up to thirty percent of the businesses haven't reopened. Um, yeah. That they they're allowed to, but you know, their ability to uh, and their cash to, uh, uh, you know, clearly buy stock or rehire staff just isn't there. So um, uh, you know, despite being able to open. It's already had a severe impact on, on, for example, uh, you know, small businesses and in, in markets like China, for example. Yeah, the um, safe distancing is going to still stuff up bars and restaurants. Well, any place that relies on, on you know, social contact. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, bars are designed, you know, to have what's called compression zones, ironically, um, which are, um, uh, you know, uh, parts of the bar where people are, you know pushed together or brought together because it creates a, a greater sense of um, of social socializing and sociability and uh, and in the end is you know part of the experience but essentially literally as we used to say bumping into someone um, yeah. you know, meeting something new that's all that's all part of the um, you know the socializing experience well that's the very thing that uh, you know um, now we're uh, regulating against um, in bars and restaurants so that is going to have an effect on the people's yeah. enjoyment of those places. Uh, Maureen Crampton uh, says, "Thanks, Alan. Can you give us um, examples of example examples of how your business is positioning for the new needs that are emerging?" Well, um, our, our business um, is about and has fundamentally been about, um, uh, you know, tracking change in consumer behavior, behavior, what we call consumer volatility uh, in their in their buying uh, patterns, and uh, and then in turn. Um, helping customers uh, understand that volatility and its impact on their business. And so, um, of course, uh, there's never been a time when um, consumer buying behaviour has been uh, less certain and more volatile. And so uh, a, a, a company like ours, and we're starting to do one of our, uh, our major clients as an insurance company, and um, they're, they're um, asking the question, well, how, how will people approach risk now? What what Ooh, will yep. you know? You know, will there's some suggestion that the insurance industry, for example, will be as countercyclical in this in this um, phase as people look to protect themselves against higher risk, and companies look to protect themselves against um, you know this greater volatility. Then um, uh, uh, will they take on more insurance, for example? So that's how our business is positioning itself. It's it's doubling down on what we already do, which is um, help our clients understand um, and plan for um, you know significant and you know change in in our customers' buying patterns. I mean, the it's such a pivotal 
an important part of the equation because now with all of these different things that are popping popping around for these new challenges, they need the data and the insights to have the availability to see what's around the corner or us if just going into it blind and, and going into a you know a potential three month flip in logistics play waiting here or something it's just not going to be good enough right and obviously at the moment all these different brands and businesses have consolidated and they've thought about you know restructures and thought about survival virtualization all these different bits i mean the 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 data is the new gold for this next bit especially amongst all those different sectors because it's going to give it's going to de-risk more data is going to be less risk right like that like is that the the overwhelming okay let's go rewind back if you were a business that has been scared or hasn't used data or insights before, why should they? 101 shit. Yeah, so uh, it, it, it's easier than um, you know most people think. Um, there's a variety of tools you know, available for it, um, very cheaply and simply. We, we always say that, look, and it's an old adage, um, you know, the closer you are to your customer, yeah, the, the more effective your, your, your own brand positioning, marketing and selling is going to be, obviously. And so uh, n- nowadays, having access to that data and being able to use it effectively in your organization um, yeah, is, is clearly going to be an advantage. The main change, I think, is that um, how you and where you get that data from um, is becoming uh, more important. So uh, traditional means of, for example, gauging consumer behavior um, are starting to struggle now because they're too slow. Um, mm. So, uh, or they're inaccurate. So if you're doing surveys and you're using, um, uh, you know, uh, calling people's homes and you're using landlines, uh, for example, then you're going to get some, yeah, it's, it's too slow. It's inaccurate because you're biasing who you're talking to. Um, that, that's why um, the, uh, the, the type of data that we're using, which is things like data mined from social, from search, from blogs, from forums, um, uh, from uh, bloggers and so on. It's real time. And so we ingest daily. And that's what we would recommend um, customers do wherever they get that data from, the currency of it. And as you can imagine, you know, we're, we're sitting here, you know, three weeks into, uh, you know, our whole world being turned on its head. And so the speed with which you can actually mine that data, um, and even if it's just as simple as, as you know, doing some uh, social listening, as you say, 101, um, start doing that. There's tools and, and products available that enable you to do that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, w- we have a, a far bigger pipe um, uh, that we're using and we reach into pretty much any market in the world um, in order to access that data um, and then use it, um, as I say, through our product queue to understand and forecast future demand. But the, the you know the so that's at a more sophisticated end of the um, uh, uh, you know of the spectrum, but start somewhere and and start to you know use current real time data um, in order to understand you know uh, at least what your customers are saying about what has happened or what is happening to them, um, and then if you're you know looking for you know further advances on that, then start to uh, project that forward and use tools like ours, for example, um, which allow you to understand the impact on your, on your business. And, and, you know, the currency and the real timeness of that is, is what's critical, as you can probably imagine from how fast moving it is, uh, you know, at the moment for everybody. Yeah, I mean, to the, by the second to the to the day is, is mission critical for all of them, because every day things have been changing. Today, obviously, you know, the announcement, I think, is it at one, is it at one o'clock today, I think? Um, to figure out what's going to be happening next um, for, for New Zealand. Um, what gets you most fearful coming out of this thing? What are you most scared about? Uh, you, you, obviously, you, 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 you fear for um, New Zealand, uh, you know, in, in particular. In, on, one, on one hand, blessed because, you know, because of the, the things that everybody says, you know, we're, we're able to, you know, maintain... Um, uh, you know, a relatively, um, as it seems, COVID-free status. And so, um, and, you know, you, you can't do anything but support the current approach that we're taking. However, the economic consequences of this, um, uh, are, you know, are very high risk for us. So if, if, if there was one thing that concerned me, it, w- it will be the flow on impact um, into our economy. We're, 
you know, we, we, we can't exist off um, our own internal consumption. There's simply not enough of us. And so as a trading nation um, and as a traveling nation that uses, you know, our um, unique Kiwi spirit to connect up to our customers, form relationships um, across any country everywhere in the world, uh, you know, our ability to do that has been um, uh, uh, is, is amplified by being able to get out there. And if we can't get out there anymore to, you know, to build um, our businesses, then, um, you know, that's, that's going to be challenging for our economy. So that, that's uh, obviously a significant concern. Um, obviously, there's tools like the ones that we're on now um, and, uh, that, you know, that, that bridge that gap. Um, but, uh, you know, some things, particularly new business, has to be done face to face. So that would be my main concern. Um, is 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 how we're going to stimulate that new business. We would argue that then having information and insight onto those into those businesses, so you can form a richer relationship with, you know, those customers, even if you're not there, is going to help. But um, you know, the the rate and the speed of our economic recovery, and particularly some sectors, um, uh, you know, well known, um, you know, tourism, hospitality, like we've been talking about extensively, mm. are the ones that. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, I'm most concerned about. Yeah, the interesting point there. How do you how do you like restart an engine without trade and tourism? Yeah, well, um, uh, you know, tourism is a you know an, an, an entirely um, uh, uh, you know almost um, separate topic, given the uni- the uniqueness of that industry and how fully and fundamentally it's been shut down, and how long it's likely to be um, impacted. You know, uh, not by us potentially in our regulations, but but certainly um, uh, overseas countries, and um, uh, of course we're going to have our quarantine, which will uh, you know prevent more casual tourism. But um, the the uh, I, you know I, I think from a trading point of view, it, it is more about um, uh, how new ways, um, new approaches, um, new tools, and so on. That we're going to have to use and adapt to to help us, um, you know, uh, you know, form those relationships and 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 build those uh, connections and ultimately start selling um, uh, when we're not able to do that in person. And uh, mm. that's probably the area that um, you know we're going to have to think about and, and work on uh, hardest because, uh, you know, clearly as I said, we, we it'll be other countries and particularly the West and the US and. Um, some of the European uh, more traditional markets for us that are likely to be more challenging. Um, you know, I'm quite encouraged by the, you know, what's happening in the speed of recovery and how Southeast Asia and, and China, for example, is managing uh, COVID. And I suspect that, you know, more organisations may have to face east rather than west, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for that reason. Um, uh, it, it, that's all based on what we know now, of course. Um uh, so hopefully they, you know, they are able to continue to contain the um, the contagion um, as they have been. Man, it's going to be gnarly. Just, to, I mean, you, the the amount of data points that are coming in on a daily basis. Is your team just kind of like, what's your internal Slack channel like? Everyone's like, yo, you seen what's happening in flipping China here, or like, like what? What's the most interesting? Oh, thing you could that probably that you're just well, like, jeez. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. You could probably hear it um, pinging just about continuously as we've been talking. So, uh, uh, apologies for that. So, um, uh, well, um, we, um, uh, as an organ, as a team, actually, um, and, and given the type of people that we have in our business, who are you know largely um, data scientists and um, full stack and front end uh, developers and so on, because at the core of our business is a tool queue, um, we. Uh, they they are used to or more used to um, you know working remotely and um, uh, and you know we're uh, working pretty seamlessly actually I'm very pleased with the way that um, you know the, the the team and the morale and so on has has been kept up um, you know, even um, uh, you know without the ability to see each other we're doing a lot of stuff like having fancy dress um, uh, um, uh, competitions and so on, which keep the spirit up. And tonight, today, I think, or tomorrow, we've got you know, you've got to show your your three meals that you've cooked and um, and pitch them, pitch them to the rest of the team. 
Um, but as far as um, our technology, um, all of it's um, cloud-based. So um, we work pretty much um, uh, exclusively with AWS. Um, and uh, and so uh, our data ingestion um, isn't really impacted. Um, you know, we we continue to, uh, you know, all of the tools and services that we rely on are, uh, you know, fully up and operational and really not affected by, you know, the, um, the you know, the current situation. So um, as a business from a, an operational point of view, um, I think we're a lot more fortunate than others in that, you know, one, we can function um, reasonably uh, well. In fact, I'm delighted how well we're performing as an organization um, collectively and collaboratively on projects. And, and the lifeblood of our business, which is the data that flows into it, is really unaffected um, um, you know, by the, the current circumstances. Yeah, it makes life easier when you, you know, born in the cloud and you know what Slack means and you know what Microsoft Teams <laughs> is and you understand what a Google Drive does. What are you, um, coming out of this thing, what are you most excited about where you think the new opportunity for a new New Zealand could be? Well, uh, of course, I'm going to say in technology. Um, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we're a we're a, a great nation, and a, and a, a you know, our ability to move and pivot and and make change um, we, when we see opportunities, I, I think, is uh, you know much more ingrained. It's in our DNA. So, I'm excited for uh, that. The I guess you know if, if I can if I can call it the challenge um, that will set on us. Um, I think our um, some of our industries and sectors, and you know, we work for uh, a couple of the major uh, food businesses and so on. Um, I think our agri businesses. Um, you know, I just saw in a paper this morning about um, you know the huge orders that Zespri is shipping offshore. That's a classic example. I know in the red meat and the beef and lamb industry, um, you know, they're, they're struggling to keep up with demand. So you know, our reputation. Um, and this is coming through very strongly um, in all of our markets, and it's and it's I think a, um, you know something that uh, when we stop and think about, well, you know, we're going through this hardship in terms of COVID, but the rest of the world is watching us, and they're going, hey, those guys have got it under control. Um, they're they they are they're clean, um, that, and rightly or wrongly, when people think about food, they also associate. Um, now, how clean that company, that country is in terms of its COVID status. Um, of course, there's there's no, there's no scientific if, um, rationale for that. Um, uh, however, people think that, and part of the reason is because in many markets, um, again, when we look at um, Asia, um, we compete against uh, the US and um, and Australia. Well, the US right now, because of the news flow into Asia about its food products is suffering badly because they hear about disruption to the supply chain. They hear about, uh, you know, the uncontrolled, uh, in, in some cases, um, you know, uh, spread of the, uh, the, the virus and, uh, or, or mismanagement of it as a, as a, man as a uh, containment process. That, that is impacting then perce people's perception of the products from there. So coming back to your question then, you know, what I'm excited for, I think our food industry and our export food industry you know, and particularly in our, our premium dairy, meat, um, uh, uh, horticultural uh, businesses stand again hugely um, from our reputation, which was always for clean and green. But in a, at a time now when there are fewer places with that quality and with those uh, with that reputation, you know, I think we're going to be more competitive and stronger than ever before. And then on the other side, I think we have got a, you know, a burgeoning technology industry. Um, and again, um, you know, I'd like to uh, think that because um, we can operate those sorts of industries successfully, um, you know, without um, necessarily, you know, hand selling or, or, or being in the market less. So the, the challenges that we face going forward, I think, are slightly less so for the technology industry. And I'm not I'm not minimising the that you know the some of the difficulties which we've discussed earlier around you know selling effectively, but nevertheless um, you know I think we have first class world class technology here, and um, and you know a lot of talent coming out that you know may have left is now going to be around in New Zealand for a while, and so um, uh, I think you know the the ability to accelerate um, you know our technology industry is also something I'm pretty excited about. 
they were saying yeah on that you know i think from last year within 18 months tech will be the biggest um export in new zealand i think it was over tourism i think was number one but i'm i'm imagining in this next 18 months maybe that might be down to six months maybe if if, if everyone does their, their job right and, and tech can go go weightless and go out and that idea of the the, the brand piece I, I think you're right because it's already seen as cl clean and green and then premium and safe and all the rest of it it's going to be an absolute no-brainer for those exports which i'm which you would hope would would kick off and gets a few more planes flying around the world and gets you know some more some more of our product out to the world to actually do it because if we can't do it on trade and tourism we're going to do it on some on something so you know tech might be the savior my friend well, I, I, I don't, you know, I'm I'm not sure about its sort of its status compared to, you know, some of our other heavy hitting industries, but um, uh, I think it can certainly contribute. Um, and and I guess my point being, it was growing strongly anyway, and it, this is a, you know, a catalyst, you know, for further investment, um, and that's really important. I, you know, potentially, um, you know, we could, uh, you know, with a a strong, um, uh, um, you know, a basis for uh, growth, more interest in the sector, more investment in the sector. Um, uh, then um, I'm hoping it can be, you know, accelerated and expanded more quickly to fill, you know, uh, as you say, that void left behind by some other industries, which, um, you know, unfortunately um, will be impacted more than us. Definitely, did I really appreciate your, your time, man? Just um, good getting some insights on, from the the. The data sector and just being able to see what's coming up next and how it's going to roll you know a pretty good spot to be able to you know give new zealand some good insights for how new zealanders can businesses can sort of bounce back from this thing faster so really appreciate your your, your time man it's, it's awesome it's a pleasure robert and uh yeah best of luck to you and your and your and your viewers appreciate it thanks bro talk to you soon okay bye now. Bye, bye what a good dude smart with the data science play retail yeah the, i mean if you're a business that's running right now that isn't doing social listening definitely look at some some tools obviously they've got they've got theirs which go all the way up to their, their product queue um yeah reset a nation without tourism and trade where does that start what does that look like where does that go a uh, change in user behavior coming out of it will it go from you know consumerism to minimalism will it go to escapism you know, new new safe distancing rules. What does that look like for the hospitality sector? You know, how do bars reinvent themselves? Um, has there's going to be a lot. So today's a big day for New Zealand. Um, as long as there's clear guidelines, clear communication, what can and can't be done. Um, just remember, whatever comes out, I think I, this is the the key. I think whatever the rules are, it's all new and everyone's on the same page. So think wider. Go wider. Think about different ways to, to tweak and pivot. Like, could the bars all go into pop up shared workspaces, and then you get some bit of food, bit of bev. If you've got, if you if you're so safe distancing and you can't fit all the same space at at um, offices, maybe you can work from home, or you know, do local businesses partner with local bars, help chip in for a little bit of the rent, and then staffing can then go there as well, and then they get discounted food. I mean, there's there's just think it, think differently. Think differently. One way to think about it. All right, team. Good yarns. Data. Flipping. Data is a winner. See you soon, team. Peace.